In economics, supply and demand is a basic model which states that in a competitive market, the price of a good or service will vary until the quantity demanded equals the quantity supplied. With an increase in demand also comes an increase in price, which persuades sellers to supply more of that economic good. But what happens when the good in question is human bodies. Well, in the early 19th century, the Scottish capital of Edinburgh was one of Europe's leading bastions of medical knowledge, particularly when it came to anatomy. Fervent research into this area caused a huge demand for cadavers for dissection. In turn, this led to the rise of ghoulish resurrection men, or body snatchers as we would call them today, who dig up corpses and sell them to surgeons who were, more often than not, willing to just look the other way. Bizarrely, the most infamous of these resurrectionists never actually dug up a body in their lives. Indeed, a death of happenstance caused the duo to realize that creating bodies was far easier and a lot less messy than digging them up. And so it was that William Burke and William Hare embarked on one of the most gruesome killing sprees in the history of Scotland. Details are scant regarding the early lives of Burke and Hare. Both were Irishmen. The former was born in Ernie, County Tyrone, while the latter may have been a native of the parish of Newry, County Armagh, though we do not know for sure. Burke was a military man who first married a woman named Margaret Coleman in Ireland who bore him two children. Around 1817, he moved to Scotland to work as a navy on the Union Canal. There he met and married Helen MacDougall, who may or may not have assisted later in her husband's murder spree. William Hare is a much more obscure figure, and there is almost no hard evidence of his life in Ireland. He too was once employed as a navy on the Union Canal, and then he moved to Edinburgh, where he worked various odd jobs and was relatively skilled as a cobbler. He shacked up with a widow named Margaret Laird, who ran a lodging house in the city's old town. Sometime during the mid-1820s, Burke and Hare met and became friends. And although neither of them had a history of violence or a criminal record, it would not be long before they committed their first first murder together. In order to better understand the actions of Burke and Hare, we should take a moment to talk about anatomy and how it was perceived in society. Throughout most of history, anatomy was vilified by the common man. The idea of dissecting a body mortified most people, and so the act was typically performed in secrecy. In Scotland, human dissection was outlawed until King James IV allowed barber surgeons to dissect certain criminals who had been executed. The Murder Act of 1752 went a step further and made the dissections open to the public. This change it served to intensify the punishment for murder, not to enhance medical knowledge. Denying criminals a proper burial and instead having them dissected and put on public display was meant to add a horrific extra deterrent to the death penalty, but it also provided more bodies to anatomists working in hospitals and medical teaching centers. So, well, that was a plus. Even so, the interest of medical men in dissection had reached an apex, and the supply of corpses still proved to be woefully insufficient. Thus, the resurrectionist trade began to flourish. The money was good, especially for a fresh body, and the practice it was relatively safe from a legal point of view. Back then, corpses were not considered property, so those who possessed them were free to sell them without fearing any reprisal from the law. It was the crime of violation of sepulchres that usually led to resurrection men being fined and imprisoned. Of course, despite this legal protection, the general public found body snatchers particularly loathsome. If they were discovered, the resurrection men were typically at the mercy of their captors, which was often rather lacking. The clients of this macabre industry included some of the most respectable medical men of their day. This is perfectly exemplified by the story of one of the most coveted corpses of all time, that of Charles Byrne, also known as the Irish Giant. At 7 feet 7 inches, he was considered the tallest man in the United Kingdom. Bodies with unusual features, or freaks as they were called bluntly back in the day, commanded much higher prices than your typical cadaver. Byrne knew that anatomists were chomping at the bit to get their hands on his body after his death and was horrified by the idea of being dissected. He was proven right, as when Byrne passed away in 1783 at the age of 22, one newspaper reported that surgeons surrounded his house like harpooners would an enormous whale. 
Rail. Byrne had arranged with his friends to be sealed in a lead coffin and buried at sea, but his preparations they proved to be for naught. At a time when a body fetched up to ten pounds, one of the most distinguished Scottish surgeons in history, John Hunter, allegedly bribed the undertaker five hundred pounds to remove the giant's corpse and replace it with stones. According to the Bank of England, that is over $74,000 in modern currency. Regardless of the costs, both moral and financial, Hunter got his prize, and even today, Byrne's skeleton resides in the Hunterian Museum in London's Royal College of Surgeons of England. At the moment, there is actually a push for the museum to surrender possession of the remains and give them a burial at sea, as per Charles Burns' wishes, you know, even if it's 240 years too late. So let's get back to Birkenhair. Their first victim was not actually murdered. He was an old army pensioner named Donald who lodged at the house owned by Hare and Laird. He died in November of 1827 of dropsy, a swelling of soft tissue caused by excess fluids that we today refer to as an edema. What mattered to Hare, however, was that the old man died still owing him four pounds in rent money. Hare turned to Burke for help in dealing with Donald's corpse and then came up with the idea of selling it to the surgeons to recover cover his losses. The duo then went through a gratuitous ordeal to keep possession of the body while making it look like they had had it buried. First, the carpenter brought them the coffin, and then the three of them placed the recently deceased Donald inside and nailed the lid down. After the carpenter left, Burke and Hare reopened the coffin, took the body out, and hid it under a bed. They then packed the empty box tightly with Tanner's bark, covered it with a sheet, and then nailed it down again. The plan worked, except for the fact that it was completely unnecessary since, under Scottish law, they were legally free to sell the body. Burke and Hare went in search of Professor of Anatomy Alexander Monroe. Whether or not the was a previous connection between these groups is unknown, but the pair likely found out about him in the newspapers as he was featured for his dissections of executed criminals. Instead, they found a man who referred them to Dr. Robert Knox in Surgeon's Square. There, they were paid seven pounds and ten shillings for Donald's body. Since the army pensioner owed him rent, Hare took the bigger cut of the four pounds five shillings, which still left three pounds and five shillings for Burke, just for lugging a corpse around. The two simply could not believe their luck. That was a lot of money for easy work, with no questions asked. As they were getting ready to leave the premises, one of Knox's assistants told them that they would love to do more business in the future. If only they could get more dead bodies. So the exact timeline of the murders that took place is a bit fuzzy. After he was apprehended, Burke gave two confessions at separate times that had inconsistencies between them. At the same time, they differed from the confession provided by Hare. Even so, most historians agree that their next target and their true first victim was a man named Joseph, another tenant who resided in Hare's house. Joseph, who may or may not have been a miller, was ill and delirious with a fever. Burke and Hare reasoned that he was not long for this world, and so all they would be doing is hurrying along the process a little bit. Hare had extra motivation to get rid of him as the presence of the sickly man did not do wonders for his business. The criminal duo plied him with whiskey. One of them then murdered him by suffocation while the other sat on his body to restrain his movements. Burke and Hare likely employed this killing method to avoid making any noise, but it also had the added benefit of leaving the cadaver unmarked and undamaged. This technique later became known as burking. The most likely next victim was an English salesman whose name has been lost to history. He came to Edinburgh to ply his wares and took up residence with the Hares. He fell ill with jaundice while staying there, and again William Hare was worried that his presence would drive away other prospective tenants. He and Burke disposed of the Englishman in the same manner as Joseph. Like before, Dr. Knox paid top dollar for his body and did not ask any questions. Of course, the killers could not rely on a steady supply of people walking into Hare's lodging house and falling ill. Therefore, they started luring people to the lodge, knowing that it was unlikely that anyone would miss them. Next up was Abigail Simpson in February of 1828. She was a pensioner who lived a few miles from Edinburgh and regularly came to the city to sell salt. She stayed at the lodging house where Hare got her too drunk to return home. He and his accomplice burked her during the night and promptly took her body to Surgeon Square. Another old woman was killed in the same manner later that month or perhaps in early March.
Arguably, the first notable screw up of the dastardly duo occurred when they started targeting prostitutes. By the nature of their work, they were more well known around the city than pensioners and traveling salesmen. In April, Burke met two ladies of the night, Janet Brown and Mary Patterson, also known as Mary Mitchell. Back then, they were referred to as girls of the town, which meant that at least part of their income came from prostitution. Burke invited the two women to have breakfast with him at his brother's home. Constantine Burke lived nearby with his wife and two children, but he left for work soon after the trio arrived. Patterson got drunk and passed out. Helen McDougall also came to the house and got into an argument with Burke over the presence of the young woman. Whether or not this was planned is hard to say, but Janet Brown excused herself and left. When she returned to find her friends, Patterson had disappeared with Burke. She was already dead by this point, and she was headed for Knox's dissecting table. Patterson's corpse was more suspicious than the ones brought before. Several of the surgeon's assistants recognized her, most likely because they once turned to her for her speciality services. One of them even knew her by name as Mary Mitchell. The body was young, it had no signs of illness, and clearly had never been buried. They questioned Burke as to where he got it, and he replied that he obtained the corpse from an old lady in the cannon gate. This was obviously a lie, as he might as well have said that he tripped over it while walking down the street. And yet the medical men they did not press the matter. As for Knox himself, he was so delighted with the quality of the cadaver that he ignored any peculiar details. He preserved the body in whiskey for three months before finally dissecting it, and even brought a painter in to immortalize it in a sketch. This actually worked in the physician's favor during the trial, because his defenders argued that had Knox known that Patterson was a murder victim, he surely would not have flaunted her with so much enthusiasm. Mary Patterson became the most notorious victim of Burke and Hare, probably because her story captivated the public the most. Janet Brown probably helped as well. She offered her witness testimony at the trial, but it proved unnecessary to secure a conviction, so instead she told her story to the newspapers. Even though Mary Peterson raised a few questions, the victims were still plentiful throughout the spring of 1828. Almost all of them were women who were brought to their households, were offered copious amounts of cheap liquor, and then smothered when they passed out. Among the victims were a mother-daughter duo called Mary and Peggy Holmday who were burked months apart. Perhaps the most heinous murders happened that summer when Burke and Hare killed two lodgers who consisted of an old woman and a grandson who was mentally disabled. While the old woman was dispatched in the usual method, Burke allegedly slayed the boy by lifting him up and breaking his back over his knee. We cannot say for sure that he did this, so maybe it was an accident or maybe the killer's sadistic side was really starting to show. The second to last victim in the gruesome murder spree was a young vagrant named James Wilson. He was mentally disabled and had a bum leg and was known by the locals as Daft Jamie. The kill went smoothly at first, but there were problems when Jamie ended up on Knox's anatomy table. Some of the students recognized him around the same time that word spread around the community that Daft Jamie had gone missing. Allegedly, this caused Knox to dissect the vagrant ahead of schedule. He removed Jamie's head and legs, which gave him a distinct limp, thus making the body unrecognizable. If true, this certainly implements Dr. Knox, showing at the very least that he did not want any scrutiny into the source of his cadavers. Birkenhair's last kill it took place on the 31st of October. She was an Irish woman named Margaret Doherty. She was staying at the same lodging house as Burke and MacDougall, which belonged to his cousin, John Brogan. Problematically, there was another family in the building, James and Anne Gray. The Grays were sent to stay at the Hare house for the night, while Hare went over to help Burke kill Doherty. The next morning, however, the Grays returned and found the woman's body hidden in a pile of straw. They went to the police and reported the crime. By the time they had arrived to search the lodging house, Burke and Hare had taken the body to Surgeon Square, but authorities still found Doherty's blood-stained clothes hidden under a bed. Like with the rest of their victims, Burke and Hare kept the meager possessions that Doherty had. Even under the circumstances, they apparently didn't think it necessary to throw away her clothes. Police were convinced that there was foul play at work. They went to Dr. Knox's hospital, where James Gray identified the body of Mary Doherty as the woman killed by Burke and Hare. After 10 months and 16 murders, the killing spree was over. Burke, Hare, Laird, and McDougall had all been arrested. 
Initially, they only had been charged with the slaying of Margaret Doherty. Authorities knew there were more victims, and eventually so did the public, thanks to rumors and sensationalist media reporting. Soon enough, every missing person in Edinburgh was thought to have fallen prey to the remorseless anatomy murderers. Without any bodies, authorities knew that it would be hard to prove that any of the other murders had taken place. So they made a deal, full immunity from prosecution for the one who turned King's evidence and gave a detailed account of all the killings. For whatever reason, Hare was offered the deal first, and unsurprisingly, he readily accepted. Spousal privilege meant that he could not testify against his wife Margaret Hare, so she was off the hook as well. Hare made a full confession, and the prosecution decided that they had enough evidence to go to trial. Later, once Burke realized that only the gallows awaited him, he gave his account of the killings as well. Burke's the butcher, Hare's the thief, Knox's the man who buys the beef. Those words were part of a rhyme that circulated on the streets of Edinburgh after the anatomy murders. They reflected the public opinion regarding the involvement of Dr. Robert Knox in the killing spree. Even at a time when buying corpses from disreputable sources was a common practice, obtaining murder victims was still considered a heinous act. Knox's detractors argued that there was no way that someone with his medical knowledge would not at least have cause to be suspicious of Burke and Hare. He certainly would have noticed that the bodies that the two brought to him had never been buried, which should have been an immediate red flag. The surgeon explained this issue away by saying that, as far as he knew, Burke and Hare were in the habit of keeping an eye on lodging houses for the poor and buying the bodies of the recently deceased before anyone had made funeral arrangements for them. An investigation into Knox's actions was headed by Sir Robert Christison, a future president of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. He considered that the doctor's role in the murder spree was reprehensible and immoral, but not against the law. In the end, the authorities did not pursue any charges against Robert Knox. The trial started in late December. Burke and McDougall had only been accused of three murders, those of Margaret Doherty, Daft Jamie Wilson, and Mary Patterson. These were the three strongest cases against them. The defense went for a divide-and-conquer strategy and argued that it wasn't fair for his client to be charged with unconnected killings in a trial where the other defendant had no concern with two of the offenses. The judge agreed with this reasoning and concluded that each murder had to be tried separately. The prosecution, headed by Sir William Ray, decided to start with the slaying of Mary Doherty since it had the most solid evidence. The jury took less than an hour to deliberate and, unsurprisingly, found William Burke guilty. Helen McDougall was given the Scottish verdict of not proven or the bastard verdict, as it is more colorfully known, and was released. Her common law husband, however, was sentenced to death and public dissection. Although only one man was punished by the law for this ghastly crime spree, several people were involved whose exact roles are a bit of a mystery to this day. How was Constantine Burke involved, or John Brogan? According to Burke's confession, four people were killed in his cousin's lodging house. Was he truly unaware of the grim goings-on in his own home? And what about the wives? Most likely, they never actually helped murder anyone, but they certainly knew of their husband's actions and even brought some of the victims to the lodging houses. Burke made the shocking revelation that Margaret Hare even tried to convince the men to kill Helen McDougall because, as a Scottish woman, she was untrustworthy. The courts might have spared McDougall and the Hares, but the mobs were still out for their blood. On several occasions, they had to be protected by the police from angry people looking for street justice. Eventually, they all left Edinburgh individually and vanished into the mist of history. There were rumors that Hare died as a blind beggar in London, although this was more wishful thinking than an actual credible report. Robert Knox was obliged to resign his permission and became a pariah of the Scottish medical world. Eventually, he relocated to London. William Burke was hanged on January 28, 1829, in front of tens of thousands of people. His body was dissected and his skeleton preserved. It is still on display at the Anatomical Museum of the Edinburgh Medical School, while his tanned skin was used to bind a pocketbook and a calling card case. Suffice to say, the people of Edinburgh considered that there was nothing gruesome enough that they could do to Burke's body that would equal the pain and the suffering that he had caused alongside William Hare. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. And don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this every day of the week. Also, if you're looking for more from me, I've got another channel called Today I Found Out. I'm going to link to that below. And as always, thank you for watching.